Okay, so our subject is Prayer Matters. Prayer Matters. And uh, would somebody or a few people like to um, indicate some of the ground that we've covered already in this subject? As you can see, we're on part four this morning. Where, have our, where has our journey taken us so far? Yep, just a brief review. Okay, we will accomplish one big fat zero if in all that we're attempting to do for the Lord in 2011 we do not pray and seek the Lord's power and his blessing in, uh, in our activities. What else have we seen? Kathy? Okay, we looked at some hindrances to prayer, some of the things that each of us encounters when we want to pray, and then we started to look at some potential solutions. Can anybody remember what those hindrances were, the ones we identified? I'm sure we didn't uh, list them all. Kathy? Lack of heart. <laughs> they were all heart problems. Um, lack of desire was certainly one of them. Anything else? What was linked to a lack of desire? What oftentimes will extinguish our desire for spiritual things and for the Lord? Worldliness. That's right. Friendship with the world is enmity towards God. Um, was there anything else that we saw that was uh, a problem for us in prayer? Think about the Pharisee and the publican. Self-righteousness, pride. The publican ended up not, he didn't know it of course, but he wasn't praying to God, he was praying to himself. Um, we don't want to be doing that, that's um, a bit of a futile activity. Um, pride can interfere with our prayer lives in a number of different ways. Um, and uh, so it's something that we need to deal with. And, and what were the potential solutions that we saw? There was really one potential solution that shows itself in a number of ways. What do we need from the Lord in order to be able to overcome pride, worldliness, um, all of these obstacles, lack of desire? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and how is the Holy Spirit given to us as believers Okay, through Jesus Christ, is there a practical means by which we can um, obtain a greater outpouring or infilling of, of the Holy Spirit to help us live for the Lord? The means of grace. And the means of grace are what? The Word of God, read and preached. Prayer. Having problems with praying? Pray. What else? Fellowship. Fellowship. Good. And one other. At least one other. Preaching and reading of the word, public worship. The sacraments. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those are the channels through which God has appointed that his people should receive grace. Um, and that's why it's so important 
if there is a meeting taking place and the channel is open and we can be there, um, it's really, really important that we should be there. Okay, now, what did we come on to from there? What did we start to look at last week? There's a big hint right at the top one. No, there isn't, actually. Take that back. No hints. How to pray fervently. That's one one aspect of it that comes in down here I think with what do we how do we bracket all of this? What did we say these were all characteristics of? A certain type of prayer. A certain type of prayer that we all want to be praying because to pray a, the opposite kind of prayer is a waste of time and energy. Right. If, if God doesn't hear our prayers and is not moved by our prayers to respond to our prayers, our prayers are what? Ineffective. Okay. And James tells us that the effective fervent prayers of a righteous man can accomplish much. So we want to have effective fervent prayers. And uh, we began last week, if you remember, by trying to see um, what we understood already were characteristics of effective prayer. And uh, the ones that are in black down here are what you put on the post-it notes last week. And I've grouped them into <coughs> characteristics of the person, of the attitude of the person, and characteristics of the prayer itself. And some of those you could flip-flop between categories, but it was just a useful way to look at it. And uh, in this next column are the number of times that uh, that characteristic was actually referred to on a post-it note. So six times people said true believer was important. Eighteen times praying in faith. Ten times praying earnestly. Six times praying in the spirit. Seven times praying with persistence. Uh, so we, we mapped out what we thought about effective prayer. What did we do then? Right. We looked at the account uh, from Dalimore's biography of Spurgeon of the way that the, the prayer life at New Park Street Chapel was transformed by the Spirit of God and the, uh, has used the example of Spurgeon's own prayer life. Um, Spurgeon, you remember, was very free and familiar but reverent with God. He was expectant. And uh, these red uh, characteristics here are things that we derived from the account of New Park Street and Abraham's prayers that we hadn't uh, touched on in our own analysis. So we looked at New Park Street. We saw, of course, I think it goes without saying, that uh, these were prayers of true believers, that they were praying in faith, uh, the account it said talked about the reverence that was there, the earnestness, the sincerity, the boldness, the expectancy, the determination to, to besiege uh, the new Jerusalem and bring down the blessing, the idea of praying in the Spirit, praying in Christ's name, wrestling, arguing with God, and being persistent in prayer. Then we moved on to Abraham. And which account did we look at in the life of Abraham? <coughs> Shall 
John. Right. He, the account in which he interceded for, uh, yeah, it's hard to say what he was interceding for, but certainly he had on his heart his nephew Lot. Above that, though, first and foremost in his heart, he had a, uh, a desire or he had, um, there was an attribute, there was something on his heart that was even a higher priority than that Lot should not be swept away in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. What was primary concern in Abraham's praying? Gail. The glory of God. Far be it from you, Lord, to sweep away the righteous with the wicked. And uh, we saw, of course, Abraham, true believer, obedient. He had the right motivation, which is God's glory. Great faith. Humility, I'm only dust and ashes, don't be angry with me. His reverence with the Lord, his acceptance as uh, he showed this freedom and childlikeness too. In fact, we could put that in for New Park Street as well because that was referred to. Um, he was earnest, he was sincere. Was he bold with the Lord? Yeah, yes, he was. Uh, he was, you almost feel the trembling as you read through the five times that he returned to the Lord, persistent, wrestling and arguing with God. Are you going to do this? Won't the judge of all the earth do what is right? Um, very specific in his praying, seeking to pray according to the will of God and for the glory of God. Now, we also learn something that is tremendously encouraging for those of us, you know, how oftentimes we've got something on our hearts and no matter how hard we try, it just won't come out of our mouths. Or when we do try, what does come out of our mouths ends up sounding rather convoluted and we're tripping over our words and we think, well, why would God even understand that. It hardly sounded like the English language, let alone something that, that somebody would pay attention to or, or answer. What do we learn from the account of Abraham that was really encouraging? What was God seeing as Abraham was praying? Brian? He was seeing his faith, certainly, yes. What else did he see, Kathy? Right. Yeah, Abraham never, at least as far as the account has it, Abraham never dared to get down below 10. And he, he negotiated in prayer with the Lord that if there were 10 righteous people in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord would not destroy them. There were not 10 righteous people in those cities, but there was Lot. And God saw the concern for Lot on the heart of Abraham, that unspoken prayer. And it says at the end of chapter 19 that when he overthrew the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, God remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out from the city. That is a huge encouragement, um, to me at least, to know that God reads the heart and it's the heart that he is really interested in when we come to him in prayer and uh, next week God willing one of the topics that we're going to look at is the, the matter of posture in prayer uh, somebody had asked for us to cover that and that uh, probably next week will be our last study on prayer matters at least for the time being and God willing we're going to look at that whole subject of posture guess what's really important in the subject of posture in prayer. The heart. Uh, it doesn't matter what you look like outwardly if that is not an accurate expression of, of the heart inwardly. Okay, so that's what we've looked at. I should point out that if there is no tick in any of these boxes, it doesn't mean that that wasn't there. It just means that we don't really have enough information um, and so, um, in all likelihood, those things were there. We just can't derive it from the passage that we were looking at.
so this morning, I want to go on and look at Moses. I was going to deal with Jacob as well, but I think we've got more than enough here this morning to deal with Moses, and then we'll see whether we want to take a look at Jacob next week or not. If we don't, hopefully you have an approach here, and uh, you can look at Jacob and some of the other great uh, men and women of prayer in Scripture, and you can take a look at their prayers in this way. What are they doing? What's their attitude? What is, what is the, the burden of their prayer? And you can, um, you can see what's going on, and it's, it's really quite helpful um, to, to look at it in that way rather than just to read it um, as an account. Now, I'm going to hand this out, which is what's on the board. Maybe you could uh, pass those down. I'll take one just in case. I think I've got one here. Yeah, okay, I've got the board. And... Um, Hopefully, I did circulate uh, yesterday morning the passages that we're going to be looking at today. Hopefully, you had a chance to look at those. I think we've got time probably to read them through. I do want us to try and understand the heart of these passages. You know, Scripture passages have a heart. And um, I really believe that we, we derive a lot more from our reading of Scripture if we can get to the heart of the passage, the burden. We can understand a little bit of what's going on and, and the background and so on. So we're going to try and do that this morning. And these passages have always been ones that I personally have found very moving as you see this exchange taking place between Moses and, um, and the Lord. Um, and as we go through, what, what we'll do is we'll try and fill in the check boxes um, to see whether uh, there's anything we can learn about how these prayers are lining up. Maybe we'll find some more characteristics we hadn't thought of, but we'll see which ones are common between the prayers of Moses and Abraham and uh, New Park Street. If we keep finding these commonalities... It's because there's one person who has been teaching all of these people to pray effectively. Who would that be? Yeah, the Lord, the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's why it's quite an interesting exercise because if you keep seeing these things cropping up in effective prayer from the people of God, then I think you can be fairly certain that you're heading down the right path. Um, if we try and... Obviously, we can't fabricate. We can't grit our teeth and say, okay, now I'm going to pray earnestly. It has to be given by the Holy Spirit. It is a heart thing. But we know um, what, a, what effective prayer looks like, and we can be seeking the Lord to help us to pray in that way. Okay, everybody got a sheet? And uh, let's take a look then at the first passage that, uh, that I circulated this is uh, there's two passages there's Exodus 32 and Deuteronomy chapter 9 um, in Exodus 32 we're going to read verses 7 through 14 um, Deuteronomy chapter 9 we'll read this is a parallel account that Moses gives in Deuteronomy of the same incident uh, we're going to read from verses 26 through 29 and uh, let's take a look and see what we can find about the person, the attitude, and the prayer. Okay. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Now they've just, the news of the golden calf has just broken, as it were. Moses has been up on the mountain uh, receiving the tablets of the testimony. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. 
and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people, whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, With evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Here's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 26 through 29. I prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord God, do not destroy your people, even your inheritance, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand, Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look at the stubbornness of this people or at their wickedness or their sin. Otherwise, the land from which you brought us may say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he had promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Yet they are your people, even your inheritance, whom you have brought out by your great power, and your outstretched arm. Now, what happened when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt? What happened? Excuse me? They turned away from him, but in, in terms of how the Lord brought them out. Okay, what did God do in bringing the people of Israel out from Egypt to begin their journey to the Promised Land? Donna? Well, initially, he worked with the Pharaoh, and there were all these miracles that he did. Okay, they had seen God's power in, in the, uh, the plagues that he sent, showing his amazing superiority over all of the gods of the Egyptians. Each of those plagues was deliberately targeted on one of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped and just showed the power of God. He did all of that. But before they actually left their homes and, and started out on the journey to the, to the Red Sea, God did something that is really significant. Really significant. Brian? How did he sanctify them? The blood over the doorpost. That was their protection, wasn't it? The Passover. That was something that indicated this was God's people and that they, should be, they were being set apart. But what else was that blood all about? What was God actually doing by means of that blood? It's a picture of what he's done for us. Jerry. What happens here, I think, God demonstrated his fulfillment of all his promises to Abraham and to all his descendants that from him would come a great and mighty nation. He was showing them about his great display of power on his wooden feet. So his promise, his glory, his manifest, and they were benefactors of all of that. He was, indeed. He was showing them his power. And, uh, and they were benefactors and he was keeping his promises that he had made. Kathy? He was showing them a picture of Christ. Okay. A picture of Christ. What, 
Let's focus on the blood, shall we? Um, by the shedding of the blood, what happened to the people of Israel? What, what do we call, which has happened to us by the shedding of Christ's blood? Donna. Redemption. Redemption. What does redemption mean? Buying. Okay, purchasing. So what, what was true of Israel after they were redeemed? Whose were they? Sorry? They belonged to God. Okay? They were his people. Look what God says in Exodus 32. This is how to under, I, I'm convinced this is how to understand this passage. Exodus 32 and verse 7. Can you feel? Can you feel what's going on here? The Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once. For your people, Moses, who you brought up out of Egypt, Moses, have become corrupted. What's the Lord doing? He's disowning his people. The ones that he redeemed by the blood of the Passover lamb. He's saying, they're your people, Moses. Okay? Now that is a huge ground shift. Do you think that struck Moses? Do you think that resonated with him? Okay. Now look at his intercession. Look down to verse um, 11. What's the first thing out of Moses' mouth, pretty much? They're not my people. They are not my people. Why does your anger burn against your people, Lord, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt? It wasn't me. I didn't do those acts of power against Pharaoh. I didn't part the Red Sea. I didn't spare them through the blood of the Passover lamb. You did it. You did it. What's, our, what's Moses doing there? He's, he's arguing, Kathy. Yeah, he's reminding God of the covenant. So, is he uh, being bold? I would say so. Uh, is he earnest? Are you getting some earnestness coming through in this discussion? Um, anything else here that we're seeing already? We're seeing uh, wrestling and arguing. Anything else on those sheets that you have that uh, has already struck you? Okay, we'll see that in, in spades pretty soon. Oops, that's obedient. Well, he had to be holy, really. Right motivation. There we go. We'll see if we see that a bit later. Okay, what's, uh, what's the next thing that he says? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent... He brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth. Now what's he, what's he doing now? Okay, it is pretty specific. What else? It's another argument. What's the argument? Jerry. The honor of God's name with whom? Yeah, yeah, the unbelievers, the enemies of God. You know, the Egyptians at that time in history stand for all that is enmity with God. 
and um, they were still smarting from what had happened to them. God had shown them all of this power and all of this glory. He had absolutely devastated their land with all those plagues, and then their army was completely swept away by the Red Sea. They were, uh, as a nation, they had been absolutely decimated uh, because of their enmity towards God. And uh, now, suddenly, they find that God did all of this for this people. Let my people go, says Moses. The blood that is shed, the redemption of the people, and they come out and then God sweeps them away. Well, God, your enemies are going to say, you're pretty fickle. One moment you're saying you love them and that you're taking them to yourself and you're promising them an inheritance and you're going to multiply their offspring and the next moment you destroy them. Your enemies are going to say that you had evil intent. Okay, what's the next thing that he does? Verse 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself. See how many times Moses is saying, you, Lord, they're your people, you brought them out. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, you swore by yourself to them, Lord, that you're going to multiply their descendants, and give them this land as an inheritance forever. What's he doing? He's arguing. Is it a good argument? Are you going to break your promise, Lord? You say you're going to make me a great nation. I mean, in theory, I suppose the promise could still have been kept. But all of these people were the sand of the seashore or on their way to being the sand of the seashore that God had promised to turn Abraham into. Um, All of those promises and, and promises because there's no one greater to promise by God promises by himself. You swore by yourself you would do this. He's arguing again. Um, And again It's all based on God and God's faithfulness. His honor is at stake. He's going to be called evil by his enemies. He's going to risk being thought of as having broken all of the promises that he made to Abraham and to Isaac and uh, to Israel, to Jacob. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm that he said he would do to his people. Now there's one more argument, which is why we have the Deuteronomy passage here. One more argument that he brings, and it's down there in verse 28 of Deuteronomy 9. Um, Otherwise, the land from which you brought us may say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he had promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. So first thing he said back in Exodus is, they'll think you're pretty fickle. You're capricious. You you, you flip-flop. One moment you're set on this purpose and the next minute with evil intent you wipe them out. Now what's he saying? What was God demonstrating to the people of Egypt in all of the plagues that he performed? through Moses, through Aaron. His power uh, over whom? Over, over, over all, over all things, but over all of the gods of the Egyptians. What's happening in Deuteronomy 9? What are the Egyptians saying? <laughs> Maybe he's not so different after all. Maybe he just couldn't do it. You know, he got them so far, got them through the Red Sea, but then he just couldn't do it, couldn't take them the rest of the way. He's not that different from our gods, is he really? Is that a... Jerry?
Right, and initially they were able to keep up through their magic arts with the signs that Moses was given to do, but there came a point where they couldn't anymore, and they went to Pharaoh and they said, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh was so far gone in his hardness at that point that he was uh, just determined to continue. So, I hope you can sense something of what's going on in these passages, the heart of Moses um, as he comes before the Lord. And what he's hearing from the Lord is, I'm disowning these people. Uh, And he starts calling them your people, Moses. And Moses comes right back to the Lord and says, "Uh uh-uh, that's not how it is. I didn't redeem them. I didn't promise all these things to them. I didn't part the Red Sea. Um, And just think, Lord, what your enemies will say if you go down this path. And uh, your name, Lord, will be subject to, to mockery and scorn among your enemies. Anything else popping up out of these accounts um, to, to check on the right-hand side there. I think we can say that Moses was a true believer and largely obedient. There are some accounts in Scripture where he wasn't, but the Lord spared him for that. Donna. Yeah. Right. Ah, yes. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> One thing that lies on the surface is that the things that God announces that He is about to do. Um, he may be deterred from doing, as it were, if that's the right word. We're treading in interesting territory on uh, the sovereignty of God. In God's sovereign purposes, he was never going to sweep away the nation of Israel. He would have been utterly just and righteous to do so. They earned it. And it wasn't on the basis of their merits that Moses came before the Lord and said, look at these people, they've made a bit of a mistake, but, you know, basically they're pretty good, aren't they? Um, He doesn't plead their merits. We've always said that one of the things that God does in, in working out his purposes is to take the prayers of his people and weave them in. And so, again... God gave Moses this position and this opportunity and this prayer because it was God's intention to to show mercy to Israel and to do it through the intercession that Moses would bring. We saw it with um, Jonah going to Nineveh. Forty more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And Jonah didn't like that message because he knew that in giving that message the people may repent and then the Lord may uh, acknowledge that repentance and show mercy. So I'm probably not answering the real heart of the question. Sean, you have some comments. That's helpful. (laughs) Right. (laughs) 
Yes. Right. It does. I mean, it, this should be a huge encouragement to us. A, we have a mediator in the Lord Jesus Christ who always lives to intercede for us and he has more potent arguments to deliver on our behalf than Moses could on behalf of Israel. He's got better blood to plead on our behalf. That's an amazing encouragement. But also, in terms of our prayers, to understand that although it may look, I mean, we, we don't have the mind of God revealed to us directly as Moses did in this case, but you know, we, when we see circumstances stacking up a certain way and it looks as though something is inevitable, it's not. It really isn't. And also, remember how in the first study we looked at that passage where God says, even though Moses and, uh, who was the other one? Was it Samuel? stood before me, I will still <laughs> judge these people. There comes a point in, with God when even people he's appointed as mediators could have no arguments that would prevail. His justice must be done. Um, any other boxes we can check and then we need to take a quick look at the second passage. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he is determined, and his determination is that God shouldn't do anything to dishonor his name in the midst of his enemies. And uh, he's persistent because. He keeps coming back with argument after argument after argument, um, which is a very interesting facet of the prayer of these people. That is desiring God's will. He knows that over everything, the, God is jealous for his name. Um, God is about to reveal his name to Moses. Uh, we'll see this in our, at least the lead up to it in our next passage. Yes. The character of our arguments. Um, A. If we have arguments that we can deploy in our prayers, we shouldn't be afraid to do so, provided that those arguments are grounded in the right place, which is the honor of God's name, his glory. And do we have any arguments like that today? Could we argue in some instances the same way that Moses argued with God? I think so. For sure. Let's take a look at Exodus 33, our next passage. Um, and again, this follows on from the previous account. The Lord has agreed he's not going to destroy them. Now he comes with, with some heartbreaking news based on what just took place. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your descendants I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst because you are an obstinate people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard this sad word, they went into mourning and none of them put on his ornaments for the Lord had said to Moses, 
Say to the sons of Israel, you are an obstinate people. Should I go up in your midst for one moment, I would destroy you. Now therefore put off your ornaments from you that I may know what I shall do with you. That is sad news. I'll send an angel. But I'm not going to go with you, Moses, because if I was with these people who you brought up out of Egypt, um, I, you know, I almost destroyed them now. I would certainly destroy them on the way. That is terrible, terrible news. Is Moses going to say, well, okay, Lord, I understand. Um, makes sense to me. We don't want these people destroyed. Um, so send the angel. Keep your promises, and that's fine. Is that what Moses is going to do? Let's find out. Verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people. But you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you also have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us, so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are on the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Was Moses going to settle for an angel instead of the presence of the Lord? And how did he set about accomplishing this task of securing the presence of God himself in the midst of his people. What does he do? He argues with them. Argument number one. You said I'd found favor in your sight, God. If that's true, then you ought to let me know who's going with us. And it really ought to be you. Because otherwise, nobody's going to believe that we've found favor with you. You send an angel and you're not here, as you were before, in our midst. Do you realize that if the Lord had done what he said he was going to do in in verses 1 through 35, there would have been no temple with a holy of holies, with an ark of the covenant, with the Shekinah glory. Okay, that's what's at stake here. The presence of God in the midst of his people. The thing that sets them apart from all the other people on the face of the earth. And God is saying, you know, if I am with you, because this is such an obstinate people, I might destroy them. And uh, Moses says, well, these are your people, Lord. And if I have found favor in your sight, then you need to be with us yourself. Because that's how the favor that you have granted us, me and your people, is going to be known. So if you're not going to go with us, Lord, don't send us out. 
Is that bold? Another thing that's interesting is um, this curiosity to know the Lord. It comes through in this passage. We see it in Jacob wrestling with the angel as well. Show me your glory. If I have found your favor, then let me know your ways so that I may find your favor. And out of this request to see the glory of the Lord, the, the Lord obviously doesn't show Moses his face, but he reveals that wonderful phrase. You see it time and time and time again through the Old Testament. The Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate, abounding in loving kindness, slow to anger. That's the name of the Lord. And you'll see it all the way through. It's smattered throughout the writings of the Old Testament from that point on. A huge blessing um, that comes to Moses because he has had the boldness to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, you can't do this. You have to deal with these people. They're your people. And if you're not with them, they'll be just like anybody else on the face of the earth. There won't be the slightest sign that uh, these people live under your special and peculiar favor. Any boxes that we can check there's one characteristic of Moses that's referred to. I was talking to Pastor Bryant about this, and he, uh, he indicated, of course, it is autobiographical, but it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Numbers 12, 3. Now, the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Anything else? Jerry? Okay. He certainly is showing faith, tremendous faith. He knows that God has the ability and the right to do all the things that he's been talking about. And his appeal to him, therefore, is not based uh, on that. You, you can't do this. Well, yes, he could. Jerry. Right, reverent. God. Excuse me? Yeah, he is like a child with his father. That was something that was said of Spurgeon's prayers. I think it's pretty sincere. He got bold. Um. Yeah, well, I think we can probably end up checking all of these. It's in the Spirit, I think, quite clearly. In Christ's name, really, is akin to desiring God's will, much of a muchness. So, um, as you may tell, these passages really um, warm my heart. I, there is a reality and there is a there is a heart about this. Donna, you had a comment. knows God. He met with God face to face. Not, not the full glory of God. Um, may well have been, in fact, uh, a, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ with whom he met. But, but he knew God. He knew him really, really well. Um, so, isn't it interesting how many of these things you can find in these accounts? The accounts in Scripture, um, they tie in the things that you see 
Abraham and Moses, the way that they approached God in the prayers that God heard and answered in quite remarkable ways, and the prayers of this congregation just over a hundred years ago uh, in London, there is quite a definite um, parallel in terms of the approach in terms of the the characteristics of the people, the attitude and uh, the nature of the prayers that were delivered. Now, as I said, we could go on and look at Jacob, but I think given this key, it's not difficult for us to look at Jacob's prayer and and start to say, well, what's on his heart? And what's what a, if he's arguing, what's the argument? How is he showing his concern? What's, what's the bottom line for these people in prayer? What's their top priority? Um, and you can do this with many of the prayers in scriptures. If you understand the circumstances, you understand what is at stake. Uh, what sometimes, you know, some, these moments here where Moses stands before the Lord as a type of Christ uh, and intercedes for his people, those are uh, pivotal moments. If, if things had gone differently at, at either of the moments that we've looked at in the, in the life of Moses this morning, we would have had a very different Bible. Very different. The, f- the first, all the people who came up out of Egypt wouldn't have made it, just Moses would have survived. And what would that have meant? And yet, the Lord appointed Moses to be the mediator, drew close to him, knew him in this way, gave him these prayers, and was moved by the prayers to do as Moses had asked, out of concern for the honor of his name. Now, does this teach us something about effective praying? And the kind that the way that we need to learn to pray. Now we can't work it up. Let's make no mistake about that. We can't switch this on. My effective praying switch. Now I found it. But it gives us pointers and it gives us directions and it gives us something we can go after the Lord for. Say, Lord, help us to pray like an Abraham. Help us to pray like a Moses. Help us to pray like these people at New Park Street Chapel. Give us that heart. Give us the same concern for your name. Donna. How does one get that heart? I'm going to hide behind the board at this point. Somebody else can answer that one. How does one get that heart? Yeah. It is a life. It is a life, but it's a life focused on the things that God has given us. Too often, I think, we don't focus our life there. Uh, We focus our life in the world, and that spins into lack of desire. We pick up the attitudes of the world, the thought processes of the world, and, sad to say, we quench We grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Um, But, by the grace of God, it is certainly possible to experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to experience greater measures of His filling through the means that He has given us, and to begin to pray at least more akin to the way that these 
people have prayed. And that's why I didn't just want to look at biblical examples, because sometimes we set them up and we say, well, I could never pray like an Abraham. Never pray like a Moses. Well, could you pray like a member of the congregation at New Park Street Chapel? Can you pray like a member of the congregation at Grace in Modesto? Um, these things are possible to us according to the grace of God. And as Donna says, the, at one point the, the question comes down, and again, this is all in God's hands and His sovereignty. We can't work this up, but we can desire it. And we can seek God for it. And we can implore Him. We can beseech Him. We can argue with Him that He would hear us because we are committed to Him and to the glory of His name and we want Him to be with us. To set us apart from all the people on the face of the earth because otherwise...